Our keynote speaker, speaker today, today is Al, Al Holcomb Durfer. Durfer. Al, was Al was born in Buffalo County, 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 County,
Very quickly, in September 1945, World War II ended. We dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. We had saved the world from the tyranny of fascist Italy, Imperial Japan, and the Nazis of Hitler of Germany. The world was safe for democracy, we thought. But was it? Was it really? Stalin's Communist Soviet Union came out of World War II as a world superpower to be reckoned with. In 1948, an iron curtain descended across all of Europe, dividing the, the, fighting the communist countries of Eastern Europe and the free countries of Western Europe. It was apparent that the communists would not grant free elections as promised to the hundreds of millions of Eastern European people. They had fallen under the iron hand of communism. As had the strategic country of North Korea. Further expansion and intentions of the communist Soviet Union soon became obvious. The Soviet Union-backed revolution in China succeeded in 1949. The most populous nation in the world was under the communist system. The Soviets detonated their first atomic bomb in 1949, and they developed aircraft immediately after that that were capable of delivering that atomic bomb any place in the United States. The nuclear superiority we had that we thought was keeping the peace had suddenly vanished. On 25 June 1950, communist back, Chinese communist back North Korea crossed the 38th parallel, invading the sovereign nation of South Korea. Within six months, the full might of the Chinese army was thrown against the UN and US forces. After three years and one month of savage fighting, the guns fell silent. UN resolution we fought the Korean War under was fulfilled to the letter. Thank you, Korean vets. The sovereign nation of South Korea was saved. It was said back then that we went halfway around the world and fought for a people that we didn't even know and a country that we never heard of. That's correct. But we also fought to stop the spread of communism. Only one year later, in 1954, Communist-backed rebels in Indochina, specifically in Vietnam, defeated the French and drove them out of the country. The Western world salvaged one half of the country of Vietnam. We divided the country at the 17th parallel of northern latitude. Communist north, free south. A brand new nation had been created, and it needed to be nurtured, the Republic of South Vietnam. From 1954 until 1960, President Eisenhower sent thousands of educators, economic and military advisors in a nation-building effort. They literally moved into the same offices that the French moved out of. Our leaders fully knew that Vietnam was the front line against the spread of communism in Asia. Switching to the other side of the world so we understand the evils of communism, some of you might remember the newsreels, not live TV coverage, in 1955 and 1956 of the uprisings in East Germany and Hungary against the communist oppressors. Thousands were killed in cold blood by the Soviet tanks. Brutality that violated all dignity and human rights. It was almost as bad as the radical Islamic fundamentals today. It was clear that this godless system was bent on destroying all that we stood for, our very way of life. In 1960, the Cuban Revolution turned communist. In 1962, we went to the absolute brink of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. They attempted to put nuclear missiles in Cuba. They were only a few minutes of flight time away from all cities in the U.S. We were concerned. We were scared. I remember growing up in a little town down the road here of Cochrane, Wisconsin. It had an air watch tower. It was always manned in many cities across the northern tier of states in the United States. Volunteer citizens were always peering through high-powered binoculars, always looking to the north. The route that the Soviet bombers would cross into the United States to drop nuclear bombs on U.S. cities. 
Every town had a uh, stockpile of nuclear war survival material. Large numbers of state-of-the-art intercept aircraft were based outside of Duluth, Minnesota, Madison, Wisconsin, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The entire Milwaukee area bristled with Nike Hercules anti-aircraft missiles. Every one of them had a nuclear warhead on it intended to be detonated over the Milwaukee area. Wisconsin, Minnesota was at the front line of the defense against the nuclear war with the Soviet Union. I remember that, and if you think about it, maybe some of you old-timers do also. My weekly reader showed a map every week on the back cover of the world. It was shaded in red and blue, that which was communist and that was free, and the red was growing rapidly. No one's cared too much. The economy was booming. America was good. Fortunately, our government understood the threat. We entered into military alliances in the Asia, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, which Vietnam was a member. These treaties simply stated, if a member nation was attacked, all members would respond in kind. We did the same thing in Europe with NATO, of course. We pledged our total honor as a nation and credibility to these treaties. This will come into play later, obviously. We developed a common sense domino theory. That is, if one, fell, one country fell to communism, so would the next, and so would the next. From 1960 to 63, President Kennedy sent thousands of Special Forces troops to assist South Vietnam in its struggle against the fact insurgency. This was not enough. In 1963, the fledgling, nine-year-old nation of South Vietnam asked the Southeast Treaty Organization for more help. Several countries, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and the United States responded with some additional aid. By 1965, it was absolutely apparent that this aid was not going to be enough. Large numbers of conventional U.S. forces would be necessary to defeat the communists. By now, Cambodia, Laos were under communist control. Vietnam was the front line in Asia in the struggle against communism. By this time, the second most populous country in the world, India, was under the communist sphere of influence. It was absolutely clear that we would have to call communism somewhere and we would have to do it very soon. We could retreat in our minds, withdraw our military forces from Asia, from Vietnam. We could have allowed the communist system to overrun South Vietnam, India, Philippines, maybe Hawaii, maybe California. Communist insurgencies were running rampant in South America and Central America, all the way north to the southern part of New Me of Mexico. In other words, we had the choice of fighting the communist-backed puppet forces on foreign soil, or fight them on American soil, and hopefully fight them with conventional forces and not in a nuclear war of annihilation. These are the same choices we face in 2016. Fight radical Islam on foreign soil or right here at home. From 1964 to 1968, President Johnson and his administration made the clear and conscious decision to stand and fight the communists in Vietnam. They did not slip down a slippery slope in an aimless pursuit of war. They decided to send hundreds of thousands of American troops to Vietnam. By 1968, we all know 550,000 would be fighting the peak year of our efforts. Let us not forget, once again, we were fighting in a foreign land for another people 
to live with some of the same basic freedoms that we take for granted. We had seen the subhuman, the savagery, the butchery of the communist system for over 20 years. We knew what would happen in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and so forth, if we failed. Many Americans certainly have a deep respect for spare the lives of innocent civilians. Since 9-11, I think most Americans understand that better. For this reason, this country never used weapons of mass destruction to include nuclear weapons in Vietnam. We could have used them, we could have killed the enemy, and a great many friendlies. No victory, and morally wrong. When a democracy goes to war, the support of the American people must be attained. It never was fully accomplished in Vietnam. Remember at the outset of World War II, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor did all of that. The Korean War was never fully supported. We move on to the present global war on terror. Well, radical Islam united and mobilized this country after the attack on 9-11-01. They united us. Three very capable presidents, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, never accomplished this from 1954 to 1968. You know, they never said it the way it really was in the world. Communism versus the United States and our way of life everywhere to include Vietnam. They never said it the way we just said it today. Therefore, the American people never understood and never fully supported the war. In 1968, when President Nixon took office, the needed support was never there, and we all know how tragically everything ended. All the incredible sacrifices of three million American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that paid the supreme sacrifice, these 58,307 seen for not. Maybe, maybe, but let us judge history just a little bit late when I close shortly. It's too hot to uh, do all of this, so I'm uh, doing a fast forward. After all these years, 1959 and 1972, with the end of the war not yet in sight, we packed up, we left South Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and their people to the communist meat grinder. You know, some people legally and illegally evaded the draft. They evaded service to mankind and to their country including a future president of the United States, Bill Clinton. Yet, some of us gathered here, and over three million Americans, 17, 18, 19 years old, stepped forward and answered their nation's call. You know, they served with great honor, courage, under horrific field conditions, without the full support of the American people. Those of us who returned, many times due to public disgrace, or at least public ingratitude. To all vets of all wars and of all eras, I say this to you, the soldiers who fought in Vietnam, those who lived and those who perished, did the same thing that all American soldiers have always done. They did their nation's bidding with honor and courage. They sacrificed so much, some of their very lives, their limbs, and their minds, the same as soldiers of all wars have. Please remember these facts, people. Judge Vietnam vets accordingly. You know, in some humble, inadequate way, I must attempt to speak for these 58,000 American heroes. Their names, their faces haunt us from this black wall of honor. You know, these men had no more tomorrows. They never came home to fall in love, to marry, to have children. They never hugged their mother or their sister or their wife. 
There will always be an empty place at their family's table in their family's heart. And an empty place of pain will always exist in our nation's very soul. In closing, skipping all the other pages, I'm going to say a few words I don't think anyone here has ever heard. I know they are true. I will speak for a few seconds on the great victory of the Vietnam War. The great victory it was for the United States. It didn't stutter, and I'm considered to be of sound mind. Enough time has passed since 1975. Enough time for the 2020 hindsighted historians to get the history right, but not yet revise it. After the collapse of the evil Soviet Union in 1990, we talked, and we still talk openly to many, many high-ranking former Soviet military and political leaders. And they all said the same thing. They were amazed, and they were disheartened at the incredible tenacity and determination of the United States fighting them in Vietnam. They further realized that the cost of further communist expansion would be too high a cost, even for them. The Soviet Union never again attempted to expand its communist ideology. Their incursion into Afghanistan in 1980 was not an expansionist move, but a defensive one to defend against the radical Islamic movement that was sweeping through countries bordering on their southern republics. The efforts of these heroes were not in vain. They were not wasted. In paying the supreme sacrifice, they exacted such a high price from the enemy, from the communist world. It is these heroes that won the victory. All of their sacrifice is diminished without our remembrance let us, let us and all future generations of Americans remember these fallen heroes in our hearts, in our minds, for it is they who saved us and our nation from the eventual communist expansion and the enslavement of this country. Stay for a while today, meditate, understand, and appreciate how and why you are gathered freely here today. Bring a friend, bring a younger person, bring a neighbor, sometimes during today and tomorrow. Understand and remember what they did for you and for all Americans of all generations. Thank you. Thank you for your incredible service. Thank you, heroes. May God bless you in the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Al.